Okay, so good morning. Um, I'm Lisa Phillips here with the Labor and Working Class History Association. Uh, I'm here to talk today with Jake Friedman, the author of this great book by the Chicago Review Press, The Disney Revolt, uh, The Great Labor War in Animation's Golden Age. I have a copy of it here too, I was gonna show, but we've got two here. A uh, great, great look at the history of uh, the 1941 strike at the Disney Studios. So um, welcome addition to what we know about Disney. Very uh, thorough. You can see that the book is thick. It, you know, normally chapters on the strike are maybe chapter length or a few paragraphs in length. This is the first book length treatment that we have of, of the 1941 strike. It's fantastic. So I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm Lisa Phillips. I teach history at Indiana State University. I have a PhD from Rutgers. Um, I, my book, first book was a renegade union. I look, I'll show here, um, all about labor unions in New York City, interracial organizing, all of that. And my current project is on a labor history of Disney. That's what I'm attempting to do, which is why I'm so glad that uh, Jake's book is out. Um, and just a quick plug, I have an article out in the International Labor and Working Class History uh, Journal on Disney's use of subcontract subcontract and labor in Haiti uh, that just came out last fall. Um, so, okay, so Jake, <laughs> if you don't mind introducing yourself to us a little bit more fully than I just did, how did you come to this project? What's your background? Tell us um, about you. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I'm i Jake. Jake, I throw the, the middle initial there because they're, my name is kind of common. So Jake S. Friedman, if people want to find me on the webs, so my background, I went to NYU Film School to study animation. I graduated and went into the field and worked in animation, worked on uh, some shows for Disney and Nickelodeon and, and animation for Saturday Night Live. And my final film that I worked on was a feature called Epic. I was in the storyboard department for that. So I always wanted, I loved animation, but I, I always loved the history, the background stories, the behind the scenes stuff of animation. And one of my teachers at NYU was this wonderful man named John Culhane, who had written some books on animation and the making of Aladdin and the making of Fantasia. So a few years after I graduated, but not that many years, he invited me back to speak to his class and then told me that I'd be writing this book. He told me I'd be writing the book on the Disney awesome. strike in Art Babbitt. This was not a request. He just said, you're going to do this. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how influential your professors can be to how you think about yourself and what you're going to do? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. All you yeah. need is one person to believe yeah. in you. <laughs> you know, if just one person believes in you. So uh, that I think I was like 27 at the time. And this project, I mean, it took like 12 years from that day until publication. So it, within those 12 years, I kind of like gathered up the self-confidence and decided to contact uh, the wife, the widow of the man who led the labor strike. His name was Art Babbitt. He was Disney's top animator. And the more I learned about him, like she gave me access to all of their, like uh, their archives and their personal collections. Uh, the more I learned how influential he was and his name had been kind of like, kind of erased from Disney history. Not totally. He was mentioned as a supervising animator because he, he was a supervising animator, but there were quite a few folks who were supervising animators. But he brought in all these innovations and creative ways of doing things that no one had done before that really skyrocketed the Disney skill level through the roof in the 1930s. So... Um, he had never been given credit for any of those things, not publicly. And why? Because he led this, this labor right. strike right. against the Disney studio in 1941. So I kind of was doing it for him. I wanted to tell his untold story and make sure that his legacy lived on, as did his, his widow. Like I promised her that this book would be made. She passed away before it was published, but um, after the first draft was completed. Good, good. She knew it was coming. She, yeah, she had read yeah. read it, and yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, you, and, um, I, I have a list of questions, but now that you're um, the great introduction, I, I, you know, Art Babbitt. For those of us in labor history, read this. Led. Can you tell us a little bit about the Screen Cartoonist Guild? Do you want to go there yet, 
or tell us about the strike itself. Maybe we should start there. And sure. why Art Babbitt was was motivated to lead this, what was a very successful, amazing, all of the, most of the summer of, of uh, 1941 strike. So what, you know, I think as I read in your book and know that they were friends, right? Walt and Art Babbitt came up together. They they worked together on, on Snow White and so many of the other early shorts that, that were part of Disney's, you know, success in the thirties. So yeah. can you tell us a little bit maybe about Art's relationship to the company, to, to Walt, um, to the other animators, and then how he then moved from being in that creative team to leading the strike? Yeah, sure. I knew that I wanted to tell the story and all the grit of it at, without showing um, like a villainous side to either side, because I grew up really appreciating Walt Disney and loving Walt Disney's work. I grew up watching the cartoons and going to the parks. This, this is not an anti-Disney book. And I didn't want to make it like, you know, defamatory against labors either. This is not an anti-labor book. This is pro-Disney. This is pro-labor. Um, so I, yeah, I grew up watching Disney cartoons and, and stuff and going to the parks. But I also grew up like knowing that my parents were part of a teacher's union in Philadelphia. And also they both uh, participated in a big teacher strike in 1973. Actually, here's here's a picture. This guy in the glasses and beard, that's my dad getting arrested awesome. for, yeah. for striking yeah. in, in 1973 because it's illegal for a public school teacher to go out on strike. So he and my mom and my grandmother all served time in the slammer. Yeah. As, as as they like to say, for going out on strike. So I kind of grew up with pride knowing that and knowing that um, unions are are good for workers when they're done right. So so uh, this is going to be kind of like a, a, a deep dive into how unions work also, because I was kind of learning a little bit more as I was going. And I was learning how uh, how that, how the business side of animation worked. Right. Um, I already kind of knew like the nitty gritty of, of animation. There's Art Babbitt at his animation yeah, desk. Cool. Yeah. Um, so you asked like how, how this started from like friendship to division. So, well, maybe, uh, yeah, describe, cause I love this about your book and it, it, describe the pre Snow White days, you know, at Hyperion where it, it just seemed as if in all the animators that I've read their recollections of those golden days, right? Where everybody was working together as part of a team and and, if, and and everything was creative and innovative and they were trying new things. And it seemed like it was the place as you write in the book, Disney was the studio where everyone wanted, right? So yeah. so can you describe a little bit about that? Because it's, it's a wonderful history. Yeah, it seemed like a really remarkable place to work yeah. in those days. Um, Walt Disney, just like all the other studios at the time, because there were studios in New York, there were a couple other coming up in LA, but the Disney studio, Walt uh, did, did not think about uh, profit first. He thought about elevating the artwork first, which is remarkable. Um, just when you're running a business, who does that? <laughs> and his idea was to um, you use a machine to like test animation. So you shoot your animation, you develop the film, you watch it, and then you redo it. Right. Expensive, time consuming. He wasn't making that much of a profit in the 30s, but his films were getting so much better so quickly. Right. He figured out how to, well, his team, his story team figured out how to tell a story through visuals, and they called that a storyboard. The Disney studio invented the storyboard. Now, I think that's kind of a common word today. People kind of know what a storyboard is, more or less, at least people who are familiar a little bit with Hollywood storytelling, just having a, a visual script out there. Um, but it was Art Babbitt who joins the Disney studio in 1932 after working in the studio called uh, Terry Tunes, which is pure profit based. It's like, let's just make something that theaters will buy. People love watching little things move on the screen. It's the 30s. It's still a novelty. So he's like, okay, I know how to draw. He joins this, this studio, but he, since 1929, he's aching to go to Disney. Uh, fi finally, he gets in. And um, in getting into Disney, he's noticing that uh, 
these things that he had in in New York, uh, like art classes. He he used to go to the Art Students League in New York City and other places to study figure drawing. He's like everyone could benefit if we do that here. So thanks to him, the studio started having art classes and a, a teacher that Art Babbitt brought into the the studio. And then starting at one night a week and then up to three nights a week all the artists are encouraged to go to these art classes that the studio hosts after hours. So suddenly everyone's becoming better at drawing the figure and figuring out how movement works one frame at a time. Um, that was, our, and, and Walt Disney was like, let's do it. It costs me money, but let's do it without a doubt. Walt didn't even bat an eye. Art Babbitt saw that there was something um, popular going around in New York not, excuse me, not in New York, in Hollywood called method acting. He said, let's bring method acting to Disney. He had, he had the books about method acting by Stanislavski and Boleslavski. And he's like, let's, let's do this. So he writes a character analysis of Goofy, a character he's animated. He like dives deep into the character psyche, the character being a, just a drawing. He's just pencil lines on paper. But Art saw him, Art Babbitt saw him as something deeper than that. And that character analysis became the key to unlocking personality. And that's, it, yeah, yeah that, th it, that just blew the studio wide open. I just have to say that in doing this work, reading your book and doing a little bit I've done so far, it's amazing to think about what animators can do and did do then in terms of, I think that the, the uh, exercise that they, they told new animators who came in is to give life to this ball, right? So you're drawing, you're drawing like a circular thing and you have to give it bounce in life. And then you, you go with what you're saying with Art Babbitt, you know, deep dives into character analyses of, you know, all of who they're animating brought those characters to life in a way that, that no other studio, if I'm right, if what you're saying, if I'm remembering your book right, had had done, they hadn't put the emphasis there in the personalities and the and the the. It, it's just an amazing thing from an artistic perspective. Well, I'm I'm, I'm glad that so, that's conveyed because yeah. I've always, as an animator myself, I'd always found that fascinating. Just especially working with paper and pencil, yes. more so yeah. than a than than a screen. When you have your paper and pencil in front of you, you see it come to life hard copy analog style right in front of you. And I've always, I've always been fascinated by that. It always just was magic to me. And I wanted Absolutely. to make that feel like magic in just describing it to you the did. reader. You did, and, and, and it, it came off the page literally. <laughs> but the, the, the thing that I loved about the 30s work culture at Disney that you describe is that everybody was trying to do that. And they were, it was like a, competitive thing right you wanted to a little bit one up the other person and trying to figure out how to get that life on the page and yet it was a team effort too so the comp it's like was the best from what you described of that competitive culture where everybody's working on a thing right together but competing within the system or whatever you'd say um to get there it was it's just it's like that's magic to me too you know yeah. the environment that can create that kind of um you know, um, it, 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 like palpable creative juice or whatever you'd say. It was really amazing the way you described it. And and the other piece that you did really well from our historical perspective is that this was the depression, right? So so people were hungry for jobs, hungry, hungry for jobs that they needed this, you know, they needed money. So, it, you know, there was also that, right? That you you, within the context of the misery of the depression, the emphasis on, the creative process and the work involved seem to, I don't know, make it happen in a way that maybe it wouldn't have had it been, say, the 19, I don't know, 60s. Yeah. I don't know. Do you want to talk about a, a, maybe the Depression era context for that kind of creativity or the work culture more or take it away, whatever you want to run with on that one? Well, you know, because you have a lot of artists who are looking for work, uh, Walt Disney was able to um, corral a lot of very talented people yeah. from all over the country under his roof. Um, so other authors have have written that like at no time since the Renaissance has there been such such a group of of pure talented artists working together to make to make something that no one had ever seen before. 
So um, yeah, the depression had 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 a big thing to do with that. But um, it's it, it's interesting to think about it now that people were still paying theater tickets even during the Great Depression. But I guess people needed an escape during that awful time, and so people were still going to the movies during the Great Depression, and that meant that Walt could still pay his artists pretty well, especially during the depression. Right. And, and in those, in those times, like people like, like Art Babbitt and the other top animators were earning what is the equivalent of like today's like six figure incomes yeah. by the time the thirties were, were, were coming to a close. It, it's just remarkable to think of how much Amazing. money they were earning and how grateful Walt uh, expressed himself to to his staff to at least to the ones who kind of like rose to the top like right. Babbitt and his cohorts right. yeah absolutely and he he was the first to say you say in the book that he wasn't the best of the artists right but he had his team with him and he I think from what you described what was um, involved in the story creation right he was sort of revered for his ability to give the story itself the the uh, connection with the audience um, yeah, yeah yeah Walt Walt had a very keen eye for story and uh he was very connected to like the public's taste of what the right. storytelling is right. so he so he would spend half of his time in the story room mm -hmm. sort of refining the 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 story and shaping up the story and the other half of the time critiquing animation and he would right. look at the, the animation in the in the test screening room which they called the sweat box because yes, ooh, I Walt's, love that. Yes. Walt's look, they still call it that, by the way. And not just I at hope Disney, that, but I everywhere. Hope that you we could get to that because it's perfect for you know, the sweat box. Everybody's in there critiquing. They're all jammed in, right? It was a small space under a staircase or something. I thought I remember <laughs> you saying. So yeah, yeah, yeah. At first, and then it was a then it was a projection room, right. uh, but it still wasn't air conditioned. Air air right. conditioning wasn't wasn't a common thing in, until much, much later. And right. and the the Disney Studio didn't have AC until they till they moved till they moved to Burbank, right? right Bingo. Right. Yeah. No. The and the um the other piece of that setting that's so I love how you describe it is that there weren't cubicles. They didn't. The animators didn't have their own offices in the Hyperion Studio, right? They were all sort of there, and they they could bounce ideas off of each other when they were working. I don't know. Is that is that right? I was picturing it just a much more communal kind of yeah. setting than than uh, our typical office space. Yeah, that's yeah. it. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And you were right about that. There was this friendly competition between them all. They were all trying to outdo each other. They were all in their 20s, right. you know, um, the kind of they had this like competitive spirit about them. Walt was like maybe barely 30 years old. It was just a bunch of young people for the most part, just creating the most influential visual art that and, uh, yes. in, in all in all the world you know coming out of the 1920s consumer driven age right so it's yeah. amazing timing for all of that as well yeah oh okay so so maybe now back to art babbitt and what so tell us what <laughs> what happened so how, how did it go from what we're describing now to, to a situation where Art Babbitt, one of Disney's top animators, you know, so influential, felt like a strike was necessary, you know? So well, I know that's yeah. a big question to ask in the subject that's, of the whole book. <laughs> right, and that's the um, question that I wanted to answer in the yes. book, because in, in everything that I've read pre-existing about it, it just kind of glosses over how we went from happy people working together to people marching around the studio, see, carrying picket signs, hundreds, hundreds of people walking in circles in front of the, 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 the studio front gate. How did we get from there to there? And um, it's, it's hard to describe standing on one leg, as they say, how, how that happened. But right. um, a, 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 lot, a lot of it had to do with the personalities involved, Walt Disney, and Art Babbitt, because they were very similar in so many ways, not just in their ambition to create monumental art and animation and to, and to push themselves and each other farther and farther than anyone else could go. Like Art would work late constantly. Walt Disney was constantly walking the halls of the studio after hours. Like these are people who valued maybe the artistry of this more than <laughs> their, their, own, their own free time. Right. So, and maybe that's why that they were, they were kind of in sync, but they were also very 
uh, they had the power of like conviction of their own beliefs. Like they had the confidence of their convictions and, and their, their, their background, their like developmental years when they were younger played a big part in what their convictions were. And I spent the first few chapters, not too many, but just, just a few explaining how Walt Disney developed his politics and how Art Babbitt developed his opinions. Right. You know, Walt's dad was a socialist. Um, he was also um, kind of harsh, uh, but Walt loved him. And in Walt's opinion, saw other socialists take advantage of his dad. And I, and I dove deep in there and found research about Walt and his dad that had never been uncovered before. And, and Art Babbitt grew up the child of, of uh, Russian immigrants and always felt that he was othered and always felt that he was kind of uh, um, like uh, yeah. mar marginalized. Right. He and had he a little bit of a chip on his shoulder from my reading of that. Of Bingo. Your work in our, yeah, 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 yeah. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. good, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but both of them had very strong personalities. Um, and, uh, and I guess they each had found that being the way they were had served them up to this point. So why change? Right, right, you know? right. Um, if if Babbitt hadn't considered himself the David versus the Goliath, he would never have uh, striven to that's, apply to Disney in the first place. So that's such a good analysis of that. Yeah, because when you're, you know, David, you let it all out, right? You just keep fighting. And, and uh, Walt never saw himself, I don't think, as the Goliath, even though maybe he was. Is that the right way to think about it so or? right you're so right and that was a that was maybe one of the like hits of the strike that like walt saw himself just as one of the guys that this was a this was like a family-owned shop and he had a really hard time uh conceptualizing that it had grown to like the at the time of pinocchio 1400 people right, right. um uh, and he was still sort of operating not like a not like a big boss right, man, right, right, but just like right. one of the guys. He wasn't that much older than them, but at the same time, he still had this like paternalism that rubbed them right. the wrong way. That's right. That's right. You know, and uh, and and yeah. they they told reporters this during the strike in, in Egocentric 1941. Egocentric paternalist, right? Was the yeah. quote from the New York Times from that great article on the strike. So. Yeah, that great article, Whimsy on Strike, it's yes, called. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, they didn't appreciate that in Walt. Maybe he was only developing that paternalism then. Maybe he wanted to be a father figure, the kind of which he never had. Yes. Kind right. and, 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 and supportive because he he didn't see his father that way. Right. Um, but right. in doing so, it, it it kind of disrupted the dynamics within the studio. Yeah. Um, There's so um, just to put a little bit of an, an, an insertion from my little bit of the work on this is that he, Walt admired Henry Ford, right? So there was there was this paternalist model and everybody loved Ford because he was the first to pay some of his workers at least $5 a day and avoid labor unions and treating his his people, you know, well, all of that, although we've done a lot of work on exploring all that. But in any case, that I think was part of Walt's like disbelief about what was happening because not only did he want to be a father figure, but he thought he was modeling himself after a revered auto industry magnate who was from the Midwest, who wasn't typical like Cornelius Vanderbilt or somebody like that, right? Not a robber baron. And it wasn't working. And he couldn't, like, he couldn't figure out how he still wasn't one of the guys doing the right what job, you know, doing a good job as a boss. <laughs> it, it just, he never quite understood what art and the rest of them were getting it I don't think so yeah um, I mean yeah like if you go into a bookstore today there are tons of books on leadership right or, you right, know right, but this was right. 1941 this wasn't right, something right. you would find in a bookstore you wouldn't mm -hmm. find books on leadership or inter-social communications right or things right, like that right right no it just, no it, it just like that just wasn't something that was considered a priority no so, 
I, the first book that I can think of that was like that is like how to win friends and influence people, right? right? Dale Carnegie, but that was 1948. Yes. And that was the first of its kind. Before that, no one thought twice about rethinking how you interact with no, people. No, and the MBA degree was just getting started. I mean, nobody had MBAs in that period. You know, it's it's amazing to think about how they were kind of running on that's their a, own. That's an know? excellent point. I wish I knew that so I could put that in the book. Yeah, well, I'll do it. <laughs> okay. But <laughs> like right, Walt, so, well, yeah. Walt, saw, Walt saw Henry Ford's assembly line system and thought that like this is a great way to get That's more, for, yes. more stuff done. No one was questioning that, that. I mean, there were Taylorism. You know, there were some people who were questioning the, the a toll that that took on people, right, who were monotonous, you know, who were in that monotony of the assembly line. But not yet. It was considered an, an completely efficient you know, yeah. way to produce, right? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And but like animation, want, oh, like, well, like the first animation studio was uh, like rose up in New York in 1919, I think it was. Um, and uh, it kind of modeled itself after like like a garment worker uh, yeah. Yeah. factory. Yeah. And um, and that's just, that's just how industry worked in the United States at that time. So uh, Walt Disney kind of, took what was already there and adjusted it to give space for growth and creative freedom, but knew that the only way to not go broke, because remember he wasn't making a huge profit, no. was to have as much efficiency as possible. And that was to do this assembly line thing. So- um, I love that so much, Jake. Like, tell us about that because it's not usual that you take a group of artists <laughs> and put them in an assembly line sort of and I know you have personal experience with animation. So can you, like, how does that feel? Like you, you have to be creative, but you have to do it efficiently. Boom, 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 boom. So there's some, there was some in the book that you, you have about art in that, right? That he, he was the one who, who would say, like, not follow orders so well, right? So that um, mm. I, it was a Dave Hand or somebody who, who was his boss who would say, we need this. <laughs> Here, and he he wouldn't do and I saw that as like art being his creative artist self and not wanting to be put in that box. But you I don't know if you, that's how it was. Can you tell us about Bingo. how artists are like how are artists confined? <laughs> how do you do that or what what how, what, how did that go? Yeah, confined. <laughs> well, I, you're 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 hitting the nail on the head. Um, there's nothing wrong with animation studios in general. I'm not going to say that there's nothing wrong with creative people being paid to do a creative job right. and just that job. Like right. you have a job, do that job. You have people who do pre-production, like in film, live action film, people do pre-production, people do production, people do post-production. You're expected to do your thing by a certain time because you have, today you have air date, back then you had release date, you know? Right. Right. You have a there schedule. There has to you, be a deadline, right? Yeah, right. You, have, right. you have to have a deadline. That's just the nature of, of media production, bingo. Right. Like there's no debating that. Art Babbitt kind of valued uh, his own artistry and the creative process more than deadline. So, right. he, so he would have a short scene and he would just like enter some sort of creative zone and just like work on it and extend it by like <laughs> eight times the length. Right. Right. Um, and and Walt <laughs> yep. loved this because this created personality in his characters, right. Right. and it bring it brought those characters to life. And that's kind of how Goofy was discovered. He Goofy started out with this very small slapstick scene, and then Art Babbitt took that scene in a little cartoon called uh, uh, Mickey's uh, uh, Mickey's not not Mickey's Garage. Why am I drawing a blank on this? Uh, it's the one oh. where <laughs> where Mickey, Donald, and Goofy are all working in a yeah. in a garage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, and this tiny scene of of Goofy slapstick, right. Art just dives into it and extends it into kind of like an, a deep understanding of how Goofy's uh, obtuse brain works, right. his lateral right. Right. thinking works, right. and and Walt loved it. The directors who worked with Babbitt did not like this because right. they had a deadline to keep and it was their right. job to keep things tight. And Dave Hand, who was right. one of Walt's top directors and he also directed Snow White, the feature, hated this. Right. 
Dave Hand was like a by the by the numbers, by the books. It was so great the way you described that tension in the book. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I was lucky enough in my research to find a conversation transcript between Dave, Dave Hand and Art Babbitt when Dave Hand confronts Babbitt about Babbitt's late delivery of a Snow White scene. Right, right. Like this is word for word transcribed. <laughs> and yeah. you're like a fly on the wall. Right, right. I include several conversations in the book and none of them were made up. All of them were word they're for awesome. word transcribed. Yeah, because you're you are in the Disney archives, which is not easy to get into, right? And you had those secretaries who all the transcriptions of which you were reading. Um, so well, that was fantastic. Yes. Asterisk to that. Uh, I the 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 archives are are very nice and like the people who run them are 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 very nice but they've been very um i guess closed up for projects right. that aren't that aren't like a hyperion book right. or a, or a disney editions book so this conversation i uncovered as as well as a whole bunch of really cool material i uncovered in a court document that nice. was that was, yeah. that was that was that was just like laying dormant in in the san francisco uh, oh. Ninth Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals archive. Oh my goodness, good and, research. Yeah, right. and, wow. and yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. so yeah. this this archive I uncovered. There was a there was a a uh, lawsuit that Art Babbitt and the Labor Board yeah. uh, raised against the Disney Company yeah. um, Im immediately after the strike, and right. that entire because it was. Appealed, it I was guess, a, by a, okay, that makes sense. The entire record, every word of oh, testimony, oh my, oh my inclu gosh. including Walt Disney's testimony, and every mm. bit of evidence was preserved. So I thought it was just going to be like a few hundred pages at most. It was 1500 pages. That is and fantastic. I, I went through the whole thing, I just <laughs> ate it up. It was like candy. That's and like, I just, it is like candy. Yes, yes. And uh, I never thought, <laughs> you know, I, I was a little kid who loved to draw. I never thought right. I would be able to have the attention span to read, you know, 1940s oh, court documents, but here I am that. just loving it. It's, I know it's the best, isn't it? Well, yeah. we, we have in the interest of time, um, how now that we've got sort of the personalities down in the background, down in the culture of the studio down. So tell us about like what happens with art and why he like does this, you know, why they, he and the SEG and there's Herb Sorrell, right, and the Painters Union and all the communist intrigue and all that. Um, and uh, oh my goodness, the um, the um, Willie Byoff. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, go ahead, tell us, tell us however you want to unfold the strike. Oh my, well, beautiful story. Yeah, it's 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 like the stuff of of high drama, I think, because yes. um, everything's going great up to and including Snow White. Everyone feels like they're in this big ship together. They didn't know if the film would succeed or not because no one had ever seen a, a feature length cartoon before. So uh, <laughs> there's this great um, speech that Art is giving to the animators during like a, like a creativity lecture. And he says at the end, in anticipation of Snow White, he says, like I paraphrase, but he says, if we succeed, we're all gonna make millions. And if we fail, we'll fail together. So it was like a, all for one, one for all mentality, and every and Walt also had promised um, uh, shares of the profit. This to was the key, right? This was yeah. key for later. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and there, there was a bonus plan in place already that was helping the, these top earners earn even more, which which was very generous and something that was unprecedented. And so Snow White did well, but then it did extremely well, like. 10 million well right yeah wasn't it yeah, yeah for that era's dollars yeah go ahead yeah and, and it just kept just kept making money just kept me and the, most of these tickets were like kitty matinee tickets for, which sold cheaper like 10 cents instead of your normal ticket which was 25 cents so these 10 cent tickets were accumulating to millions of Amazing. dollars um worldwide it was a worldwide phenomenon uh and um even even before it even hit that mark, uh, like right as it was finishing production, word gets out that this man Willie Byoff is coming to Hollywood. Yes, Willie Byoff is a um, is a is a guy who's who's uh, operating some of the uh, unions, the like projectionists unions up in Chicago, and it's an quote open secret that he's. Uh, 
that he's basically a racketeer. He's blackmailing right. uh, s- studios and companies, right. um, threatening that he'll take their workers on strike if they don't right. pay him, you know, inordinate sums. He, he also has ties to the Al Capone gang, right? right. Because right. of course, this is how you. Cre- I wish I had I had the creativity to make this up, but I didn't. <laughs> And his so, name on top of everything. I'm else. like, yeah. So yeah, buy off. Anyway, really go ahead. buy off. He had a yeah. scar on his cheek. Yeah. He, old, he smoked a cigarette, like straight out Perfect. of central casting, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so Willie Buyoff is coming to uh, to Hollywood, um, and he's already kind of infamous. And so Art Babbitt wants to stop him from unionizing anyone at the studio. He doesn't want Buyoff to infiltrate them. So he. So he goes to Roy Disney, Walt's brother and co-owner of the company. Roy points Art to the vice president of the company named Gunther Lessing. And, and Gunther Lessing says, let's form a, like a loosely knit social group. Let's do it together. I'll give you this book on organizing that I have. Gunther Lessing does not want a union at all. No. He just, he, but he does want to stop Willie Bioff. Right. And and maybe he wants to play Kate Babbitt a little bit. Right. So so together they they form this group, and then Babbitt on his own because he always goes one step further. He 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 gets a lawyer to help this group kind of form, and that lawyer says this is a union you're talking about. You need union status, and they have a they have a union meeting in Babbitt's home, and at this point Gunther Lessing is like, uh, this is I this is not what I meant. I did not right. ask you to form a union, right. but it, yeah, but it's already out of Gunther Lessing's control. And now this 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 in company union forms, and um and and that in company union, as anyone who knows labor knows, is a bogus union. You right. need an you need an independent union right. that 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 represents workers across the the field rather than just within one company. Otherwise, the for people who don't know in company, otherwise the the boss is running the, ma- the management is running the in company union, right? That's why you need independence. Okay. Bingo, but, and that's what yeah. that's what Gunther Lessing wanted. He wanted right. to maintain that control. Right. right. So right. I, in no other books about Disney history that I have found, do people do authors go into who Gunther Lessing was? No, He's, that was I was going to tell you. Thank you for that because it, it's Walt who takes the heat when. In your telling of it, it's Gunther Lessing, which makes more sense, who takes the heat for some of this. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah. He's making he's making all these decisions. And Walt is trusting him because Walt had right. up to this point succeeded by delegating things that were out of his wheelhouse. Right. He he right. delegated business to his brother Roy. Right. Uh, right. He he delegates animation to people who draw better than him. Right. Right. You know? Exactly. Yeah. So he's so he's trusting Gunther Lessing to do with mm-hmm. all his with legal the union stuff. stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And Lessing, and I and I dive into a little bit of, of Lessing's background. He he uh, he did not have the uh, the most sparkly reputations no. ethically or morally. Although he was very successful as a lawyer, but I I don't know if that always uh, you know corresponds with being moral or ethical. Right. So, <laughs> Depends on what your goal is, right? So. <laughs> yeah. He had a but, lot of cover-ups from what you. We don't have to go into all that, but there he was pretty shady in the twenties. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So the, yeah. the interesting piece of the of this part of the story, Jake, is that all of a sudden Malt's associated with these two kind of nefarious people, right? Lessing, maybe, but for sure buy off, and so he puts a lot of um, stock in their the two of them, their ability to work through this, like Art Babbitt. Kind of led Herb Sorrell led um, labor unrest at the studio. So, like that was that I we maybe not have time to talk at length about that, but that's a curious connection to me that he Walt would put a lot of stock in their ability to handle this because if he hadn't, it might not have gone that way. You know, if Buyoff hadn't been there and Lessing hadn't been maybe brokering that relationship as hard as he did, uh, maybe the strike wouldn't have been either on or as ugly as it kind of ended. So yeah. um anyway. Yeah, okay. you're right. You're right. And and there were animators on both sides, inside yeah. the strike and outside the strike, who yeah. who blamed Gunther Lessing for quote brainwashing walls. Yes. There was this red scare that was just coming up. 
and yeah. and um they had you know the 40s had right-wing media too and Absolutely. they had columnists who like um like westbrook pegler right he 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 right. was the tucker carlson of his day the labor journalist of the era who or the anti-labor journalist anti-labor journalist right. Right. whose right. whose column was read by like millions of people even right. though like the, the like the majority of the country voted for Roosevelt. You right. have people who voted for Roosevelt reading his journal of uh, his his column in the journals, and he's basically saying that all com all all uh, all labor unions are communist. Are communist, right? Right. Yeah. And and that was Walt's. Walt would continue to to talk about how the yeah, SCG, Walt, the Walt, screen cartoonist guild was yeah. communist led, even yeah. in front of Huac later. So yeah. Right. Okay. Um. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the way with uh, labor history. So we to the, get to the strike, like, w so why did art, why were the animators, and there were most of them, and I know there's a, so much good stuff in your book about elections, about repre union representation, about how that went, and it, it goes on about, you know, which union is going to represent, and Walt keeps saying, we need a vote, and, and the vote always comes back for the Screen Cartoonist Guild, which is the union that neither Lessing nor Walt wanted to represent the animators that Art Babbitt was a part of, right? Yeah. So in any case, can maybe we go back a few steps, which is what were the animators striking about or for? Well, at the beginning, they just wanted representation. Right. Okay, so Hollywood in, in the 30s, every craft has a union, starting with the Screen Actors Guild and then screenwriters, Screen Directors Guild, every every craft, the projectionists, the office workers, the background painters, the camera operators, like everyone in Hollywood has a guild. Right. Except for the animation artists. Except for the animation artists, right. And then finally, an independent union called the Screen Cartoonist Guild forms right. and begins unionizing and starts with MGM, who right. animates, you know, Tom and Jerry. And followed by every other studio that produces animation, finally Warner Brothers. And then Disney is the last studio to not have an animation union, which is the last union to represent any craft workers. Right. So Disney was like the holdout. And these folks were like, why can't we just be like every other studio? Why can't, why can't we have this? And Walt didn't understand. He said, I don't, I give you these great uh, amenities we right. have like a coffee shop on right. the premises we have like an auto shop on the premises you all have, the all the classes that they were able to take everything all, all these do. art yeah. classes um yeah. but the thing is like there were some people way at the bottom who walt didn't seem to notice and they were earning like less than the same people earning oh, in like the other studios right in the other studios yeah so yeah. um so, so they just wanted the same. They just wanted right. like the same benefits, uh, the same salary. Um, and and Walt, I guess, through Gunther Lessing, was just, like adamant to maintain control and and fight and fight this union. Um, and uh, you know, as as he said, the union eventually won, but only after like a very bitter nine week battle. And this is nine weeks in the summer in L.A. when you know. People are just like walking, they're on their feet. There was a 24 hour picket line, people taking shifts, but everyone was on deck for uh, clocking in time and clocking out time. So in the heat of the summer in LA, all these, all these people are on the picket line and it just wore them down and just like made people just bitter inside and out. People were bitter on the inside because the, the strikers had a megaphone, which Art Babbitt often took to yell epithets into without proper forethought. I, I would I would say it was without... brutal. He was me. I mean, I don't know what the word is, but uh, yeah, if you were not with him on the picket line, then you were called out in yeah. really harsh ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So yeah. it so Babbitt didn't didn't act in a way that anticipated working with these people in the future. Right. That's right. That's the right way to put it. Right. He he didn't care about the future relationships that he would or wouldn't have with them, and that came back to hurt him for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. He did. Yeah. So 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 when the strike won and the union was brought into the studio, a lot of the people who went out on strike found that it just was a toxic place for them to work. That they had made enemies 
with a lot of the people on the inside. Not everyone left. A lot of, well, like a, a number of strikers stayed on and continued a lifetime career at Disney, but the majority of them uh, left. And at the end of the book, of my book, there's a um, there's there's a listing of all the strikers, yeah. and, and I identify yeah. which of Great. those left within a couple of years. Can you? We only have about seven minutes, maybe six. But can you talk about that toxicity? Like, that's talk about I what? think the toxicity that developed. I mean, this is 1941, and it's mm -hmm. it's a really heavy union dense era. Right. We had the CIO, the Wagner Act, all those things. And so it was more common than not, or at least for 40 percent or some people are 50 percent of people were unionized. Then all the unions that you describe in the other sections of of animation, even right. And in, in every mm -hmm. so. I don't know how to phrase this, but, there, you know, you would think maybe given the pro-union context that were they were living in that wouldn't be so toxic like it wouldn't mm -hmm. create such a a division within the animators or everybody at disney as it did what do you think was driving that i mean it was maybe walt and gunther gunther and lessings and buy-offs sort of you know stubbornness mm -hmm. to sort of talk to babbitt and the animators maybe they could have brokered a better relationship there mm -hmm. as it was going on but mm -hmm. it just, it was so damaging. I mean, it yeah. was so damaging to Walt, like he never recovered from what I understand. And and to Art Babbitt, right, who they lost. And like, so maybe, I don't know, Jacob, where you want to go with that. But well, okay. the division was so stark in a, in a, in a, in a work setting that was so great <laughs> Yeah. prior or seemed to be. Maybe there were divisions there that always existed. Anyway, go ahead. I see that that you two are lamenting the loss of these halcyon days, the same way I would. Um, I wrote this book because I wanted to step into a time machine and go back. And I was, you know, I worked with animation people for 10 years or more. I, I know what kind of people the field attracts. It attracts people who are creative and weird and maybe with ego. And there's some childlike whimsy about them and people making jokes all the time. Um, and and uh, when push comes to shove, you sit down and work hard to like get this common vision done. Right. You know, people who think long term, people who are in for the long game. And I tried to apply what I knew about the people in animation to this, when I first wrote the book, my very, very first early draft, I had a bunch of imagined conversations. I thought that that nice. would be the way to do it, to fictionalize yeah. it a little bit. But then I eliminated all the fiction and just okay. stuck with the facts after some, right. Right. some friends suggested I do so. Yeah. Um, the, the bitterness came um, because, well, in part, because of this threat of like communism that was that, that all these papers were talking about. And actually a group of loyal artists in the Disney studio wrote um, anonymous letters. They called themselves, we assume there were 21 of them. So they right. called themselves the committee of 21, just anonymous letters, so defamatory saying, um, we know you're communist led, you're going to fail. Um, right. Herb Sorrell, who is your leader, is actually a member of the Communist Party and wants to overthrow all sort of industry and government. And I included one of the one of those letters, at least in part, in in the book. So there's there's the slander that these strikers are getting from inside the Disney Studio, um, as well as other folks who are calling all unions um, communist led. So they, they're like, okay, we're weaponizing language now? Okay. And from what I gathered, that's when they started calling Walt an anti-Semite. Okay, I get it now. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So now we're taking things personal. Mm -hmm. And this is probably Herb Sorrell's leadership, I guess, because he was a very tough uh, and um, kind of com uh, combating guy. He used to be a boxer, so it was like whatever works to get what you want. And in being combative, he encouraged Babbitt to 
uh, like bring bring a like little pistol to work one right. day. They had you it know, in just, his desk drawer. You said, "Wow, uh, people!" Yeah. Uh, and he had it open so people could see it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. there there was just a lot of like using whatever tricks that you had available. So calling names and accusing people of being communists on this side or anti Semites on that side was just, I guess, part of the, the, the game of getting what you want, but again, didn't have a lot of forethought. And no. unfortunately- Name of the game in the thirties, it was like class war then, you know? I mean, so yeah, in the forties, but you know, coming out of the thirties anyway. Yeah, comment. yes. Well, I was, I was able to uncover like that, that myth of Walt Disney's anti-Semitism, right. quote right. unquote. Right. I was able to uncover that. I was able to That's uncover right. all these missing conversations that explain Walt's point of view about, about the strike. I was able to uncover Walt's childhood influences that had never been written about before. And I, I was able to find Art Babbitt's creative influences and how he changed the animation industry Absolutely. forever, making Hollywood a wall-to-wall -wall union shop. And um, with side characters like the mafia and other labor leaders of the time, and this like kind of a sinister Vizier yeah. in, in Gunther Lessing. I, Absolutely. Yeah, I, I hope that the reader enjoys story. this story. It's a great, well, I, we're coming right up on nine and, um, you know, we can't cover everything, but the book is here. <laughs> so I encourage all of you to get a copy of, of Big, Friedman, Big S. Friedman's book, The Disney Revolt by Chicago Review Press, published last year. Great, great read. And Jake, thank you so much for taking your time out to talk with us and with me. And we'll we'll put it on Lacha's website so everybody can see it. And um, that's lacha.org, L-A-W-C-H-A.org. Cool. So thank thank you very much. So. Cool. And if anyone wants to get a discount, you can order through Chicago Review Press. Use discount code Disney25 to get Disney a 25. 25. Okay, got yeah, it. To get 25% right. discount. So thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.